Hi guys, so this is my video on the history of autism and the autism diagnosis. I'm starting from the coining of the word autism and bringing you up to today. I apologize if you're Swiss or Russian because I'm about to butcher a couple of names. Uh, so the first use of the word autism, I have to look at my phone for a couple of these things here, was a Swiss psychiatrist, Eugene Bluyer. Bluyer. Uh, see, see what I mean? Uh, in 1910, he coined the word autism from the Greek autos, meaning self, uh, but he was not using it in any way uh, like we do now. He was not using it for a developmental disability. He was using it to describe a subset of, of uh, schizophrenic patients who were very withdrawn into themselves. In the 1920s, a child psychiatrist, a woman named... I apologize again, Grunya Sukareva uh, described a syndrome that's probably what we now would call autism in the 1920s. I don't know if it's because she was a woman or Soviet or both, probably both, uh, but it never, no one really seemed to pay attention to that. She didn't use the word autism, but hers is a first description of what we would now call autism. The first use of the word autism in its modern sense, was by Dr. Hans Asperger uh, in 1938. He used the term autistic psychopathy to describe a group of children who had normal speech and language development, although unusual use of language, poor social skills, uh, physical clumsiness, they were very awkward trying to relate to their peers, normal or above average intelligence, particular, particular interest in certain areas, does any of this sound any of this sound familiar? He used the term autistic psychopathy to describe these children. So that's considered the first use of autism in its modern sense because he was referring to children with a developmental disability uh, as opposed to psychiatric patients. However, the intertwining of autism and schizophrenia would go on for decades. This is nowhere near over. This is just beginning. So, in 1943, is the big turning point, Dr. Leo Kanner wrote his paper on what he called early infantile autism. So, this is now the first use of autism by an English speaker. So, that's probably why it got more attention than the German or Russian people. We'll be getting back to Dr. Asperger in a moment. So, he called it early infantile autism. And infantile autism meant... A, a childhood onset or infant onset form of schizophrenia. Autism was believed to be schizophrenia, and it was believed that it manifested differently in children than it did in adults uh, because of children's underdeveloped brains. Um, Dr. Asperger wrote his paper in 1944 um, that would go on... Of, sorry describing what would go on to become Asperger's syndrome. He wrote his a paper, like the paper that got published officially in 1944. Uh, because he was German, because it was World War II, it, it did not get noticed. Um, it stayed hidden for decades. So we'll have to jump back to uh, Dr. Asperger a little bit farther in. Uh, so in 1952, uh, infantile autism was included in the first DSM. DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's kind of the Bible of mental conditions in the in, in North America anyway. A lot of places use the IDC, International Disease Classification. Uh, so the first DSM came out in 1952 and it included infantile autism but infantile autism, it was considered schizophrenia. These were kids with schizophrenia. And at the time, uh, psychoanalysis was sort of the thing. It was how mental illness was explained. So just like, let's say you got a physical injury and never recovered properly, you might have a physical problem the rest of your life. The thinking was, this is, this is Freudian, by the way, that if you suffer a psychic injury, you could end up with mental illness the rest of your life. So, in an attempt to figure out what was causing these children to end up this way, um, it was a man named Brutal Bettelheim 
came up with the theory of refrigerator mothers. He was it was basically all about maternal deprivation. These mothers were cold and distant to their children, and the children were being traumatized by that, and this is how they were ending up. They were ending up with infantile schizophrenia. Some people cite Dr. Canner as having started that. He actually denied that. He said, yes, he talked about parents uh, in his paper. He may have used the word cold to describe parents, but these were more observations. He claims that he never said that parental deprivation or maternal deprivation uh, caused autism. He claims he never said that. Uh, and I believe it should be Bruno Bettelheim who got the blame for that one. Because that went on for decades of mothers getting blamed. And yes, it was mothers more than fathers because it was the mid-20th century. Bruno Bettelheim was a Holocaust survivor. And he extrapolated a lot of what he saw uh, in concentration camps onto other mental conditions. He saw how people in these concentration camps would get traumatized and withdraw into themselves. And he, he extrapolated that onto these children are being traumatized by their cold mothers and withdrawing into themselves. So for decades, mothers were getting blamed for their children having severe developmental problems. Uh, so in 1968, the DSM-2 came out. It was still called infantile autism. It was still the mother's fault. The only difference was the R word was added. Sometimes this condition comes along with the R word. That was the only change. Um, the big change happened, there was a twin study in 1977 where they noticed a higher rate in identical twins or of both twins having ASD versus in fraternal twins. Fraternal twins grow up in the same environment. So if the mothers were doing it, then it shouldn't matter if the twins are fraternal or identical. So that study was kind of a turning point. Um, in 1980, autism was now considered a developmental disability, but you wouldn't know it looking at the DSM-3 because it still says infantile autism. It officially was no longer schizophrenia, but the wording didn't really change. People, mothers still, some mothers still got blamed in the 80s. Um, the big change was 1987 with the DSM-3 revised when they added in PDD-NOS. Pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. So now they're acknowledging that autism is a developmental disorder. The, the term pervasive meaning it pervades all areas of development as opposed to just, you know, speech or just physical or just learning. Uh, it pervades all areas of development. And the term PDD-NOS was added in uh, to sort of catch kids who met some but not all of the criteria. NOS exists in the DSM in all the categories, right? Mood disorder NOS, anxiety disorder NOS, um, personality disorder NOS, and so on. Because unlike physical illness, you can't just peel someone's head and see what's going on in there. I'm sorry, peel back someone's... <laughs> sorry, I misspoke there. And see what, you know, there's a lot of guesswork involved in psychiatry. So they have these catch-all categories, or these catch-all diagnoses in these categories. And that's kind of what PDD NOS um, is, or was. It was kind of the catch-all for kids who didn't quite match the symptoms um, of autistic disorder. I, I missed that too, didn't I? They changed the name. <laughs> Sorry, it's a big one. I messed that up. They changed the name from infantile autism to autistic disorder in the DSM-3 revised, which came out in 1987. So they finally got away from that terminology that was being mixed in with schizophrenia. And it was sort of established that this is a separate, um, a separate diagnosis. So in the past, I would be saying that, of course, rates started rising in the 80s. This is when they added PDD NOS. I no longer believe that. I now know that better diagnosis and widening into a spectrum only accounts for a fraction of the increase and that there is something actually going on. Um, and not saying there isn't is part of the whole neurodiversity thing. So now I know better. So now I know that the timing is kind of coincidental, if anything. Uh, in 1991, a, a woman named Dr. Uda Frith translated uh, Dr. Asperger's paper into English for the first time. And Asperger's disorder or Asperger's syndrome would be added to the DSM-4 in 1994. Now, the term was used first by Dr. Lorna Wing um, in 1981, 
possibly in the 70s, I'm getting conflicting information. I'm assuming Lorna Wing was bilingual, because the paper hadn't been translated to English yet. Uh, but it was translated in 91, which led it to be included in the next DSM, the DSM-4, that came out in 1994. It still had autistic disorder, but now it had four subcategories. Uh, PDD and OS was still there, Asperger's, uh, Rett Syndrome, and Childhood Disintegrative Disorder. I have no idea why Rett Syndrome was ever in the DSM. The neurodegenerative condition with a known you know, genetic cause. There are many conditions like that. Even before they knew genetic cause, they were never in the DSM. So that one confuses me. But it was there, whatever. So that was the beginning of the widening of autism from just what's now the severe end of the spectrum uh, into including people like myself. The next change, the DSM-4 revised, which came out in, in the year 2000, um, they changed the terminology. It was no longer autistic disorder, it was pervasive developmental disorders. That was now the name of the category. And there were five diagnoses that made up the pervasive de developmental disorders category, being once again classic autism, PDD NOS, Asperger's, uh, childhood disintegrative disorder and Rett syndrome and those first three conditions and sometimes childhood disintegrative disorder as well but not always those first three conditions are always considered the autism spectrum so the autism spectrum was within the PDD uh, category um, and that's how that's the model I was familiar with when I was diagnosed and all that that's how I knew it in 2013, the DSM-5 came out, and they collapsed it all into one diagnosis, uh, Autism Spectrum Disorder at Levels 1, 2, and 3, so mild, moderate, severe. And all those other diagnoses, I guess Brett Syndrome is just out of there now. And the rest of those diagnoses don't really exist anymore. They've all been collapsed into ASD. When they did that, I was a fan of it. My own brother has been anything from PDD NOS, high functioning autism, Asperger's. They've given him so many labels over the years. And I thought, you know, it doesn't matter so specifically. I thought, as long as you have the, you know, mild autism designation, that denotes what that person needs. I've changed my mind on that for a couple of reasons now, and I would love to see it expanded back out. And I know I'm not the only person. Some people think it just encompasses too much. It's not useful to say 1 in 50 people or whatever it is have ASD. Because there's such a wide range in there. That, yeah, maybe it is 2% of the population. But some of those people have such different needs than others. Um, I support separating it out for two reasons. When I learned about pathological demand avoidance, that changed a lot. Pathological demand avoidance, the term is only used in a handful of countries. It was coined by a British woman um, is in the 80s. She wanted it to be a separate thing, you know, alongside Asperger's, PDD, NOS, classic autism, and so forth. She wanted it to be, it, it never took off like that. So the terminology they use now is that it's a um, group of traits that occur in some people on the autism spectrum. When I discovered PDA, I, it was like I was reading about myself. I've never related so much to any diagnosis. So I would love for that to be in the DSM. It would have helped me when I was younger. It would have made people around me understand me. So in order for that to go into the DSM, it needs to be separated back out of this ASD level 1, 2, 3 thing. Um, when you look at other categories, you wouldn't say someone has you know mild personality disorder. Because that doesn't make any sense. Someone with antisocial or narcissistic or borderline, or all of this, they're all different. They're all different disorders. Um, so saying they have mild personality disorder is useless. So why would you do that with this category when everyone is so different? I want to see it expanded back out the way it was, uh, except for Rett syndrome. I don't know why that was there. Um, childhood disintegrative disorder, there was a, a subset of kids who start regressing in their development. 
That's actually part of what happens with the uh, MMR vaccine. The MMR vaccine is given at 18 months when some of these children who were seeming to develop typically up to that point start going backwards. That should be, in my books, considered its own form of autism. Um, because it is an unknown phenomenon, so I don't know why they squished all this stuff together. So spread it back out. Uh, put, you know, the things that were in there before. Put in maybe PDA, high-functioning autism, whatever else. Make it more specific. Yeah, I know there'll be issues, and people won't always agree on diagnoses and labels, but it's better than it is now. Uh, the other big issue is the neurodiversity movement, which I will never stop talking about because it bears repeating. I did a video recently called um, There Really Is an Increase in Autism. If you want to hear more about how stupid that movement's gotten, uh, watch that video. But one of the problems is having it all collapsed. Is it gives these people, look, you're autistic, I'm autistic, it's all the same. These people don't understand, some of them, how severe autism can be. They insist that all autism is the same. That since they live with autism, they understand these other people. Uh, some will even say severe autism doesn't exist. So separate it back out. Put those people back under the Asperger's label and get them away from the autism label. Um, I, I believe would at least help with some of the bullying and the things that go on. Uh, and it's worth noting, I feel like this is probably a good way to wrap this up, because I brought up vaccines and then kind of wandered into another subject. So I need, this also bears repeating a million times, I'll never stop saying this. Uh, vaccines don't cause autism. Whatever is going on, the babies are probably born with it, it's probably happening before they're born. Uh, even if it isn't, it's still not vaccines. That study was discredited, that doctor lost his license. Uh, the study was flawed, there was bad information in it, the sample size was too tiny to be useful for much of anything. So if you take away one thing from this video, whatever's going on, whatever's causing the increase, whatever you believe, better diagnosis or otherwise, it's not vaccines. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video, that little history of the autism spectrum. Uh, I guess if I missed something, let me know. Thank you.